It's an absolute pleasure today to be sitting here with Ray Pointer. Ray is the founder of New MR. He's on the SMR Council. He's an author of multiple titles and most recently has been a keynote speaker at the Research Association of New Zealand annual conference. Ray, welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. I, I want to have a hopefully a slightly different conversation with you compared to what others normally have. I want to find out about Ray Pointer, the person. First of all, start off with your early life. Where were you born and raised? What, what, what was your early life like? Um, so I come from Nottingham, a town, city in the centre of England, born there, raised there. And in fact, my home home has never been more than three miles, five kilometres, from the hospital I was born in, <laughs> despite the fact that I travel all the time. What, what sort of hobbies, what sort of activities did you do? What, what, what kept you interested in those early years? Um, we used to have books delivered by the library. We had a van came to our estate. I was on a coal mining estate and once a week the library van would come. So I'd go down and get three books, take them home, read them, take them down the next week. So one of the passions I had from, I guess, eight years old was three books a week. I read three books a week for, I guess, ten years. Um, and that developed a, a pathological love of new information, really. One of the things that differentiates researchers from others, I think, is curiosity. Is that the beginning of Ray Pointer's curiosity in life? I think maybe it's the beginning, but maybe it was the just a, an exhibit, a syndrome caused by it. It was a, a thing that I did because I had the curiosity. And could that also be the reason, uh, the thing that pushed you into a career in market research, do you think? No, the, like most people, that was an accident coming into market research. Um, and it's a, a quite an interesting story in its own right, um, how that happened, I think. I did computer science at university, and my first job was writing statistical software for the first Apple IIs imported into the UK for a market research company. And we were writing cluster analysis programs and things like this. We, I was writing cluster analysis <laughs> programs and reading the background literature. And then I started helping the agency process the data. And then I said, no, 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 it means this. And then I started telling them what the data means and how they should ask better questions. And within a year, I was designing the research and implementing the research and interpreting the research on the software I had written. So I kind of felt that I could do the research better than my clients. Um, and so I started doing it that way. So I very much came in from the, the other side. I started as a software programmer, writing the systems, and then started using the software. Are there any characteristics of uh, the software programmer that you were that helped you, do you think, become a good researcher? I was an incredibly early adopter of prototyping. So I would write software to see if it worked rather than go through a big, big design process. Now, this made it a challenge for me to pass my degree because it wasn't approved of. Um, but it meant that I explored and tried things. So I would create a new method of collecting data using paddles we used to have on the, those Apple IIs and then see whether they worked. And then we did some voice data collection and see so where that worked, and it didn't, it was really hard work. Uh, we got people touching screens and found that their arms got really tired. So doing lots and lots of experimentation, and I think that is a, a characteristic of wanting to explore. Uh, and then it just brought the themes together, really. So you've been in market research for 40 years, I believe. Mm -hmm. Describe to me what research was like 40 years ago in the context of today, so what was different? Um, well, the industry was very different, and so people would write you a letter to say, we are thinking of doing a piece of research, can we arrange a meeting? Because you didn't have a telephone. Mm -hmm. um, most offices would have one telephone shared between several people. Um, and so you'd write and you'd set up this meeting, you'd go and visit them and say, we want to do some research into this new margarine. So you would start commissioning the research, you would get the questionnaires printed, you would post them around the country, they would be filled in by people who knocked on doors, they'd come back, somebody would type them up, um, the numbers would be punched, you'd do the analysis. So for three months, you would be driving everybody at home crazy because you're watching every margarine commercial that's happening, you're buying different margarines, you're thinking about margarines. So when you got to do the analysis, you were really in the zone around about that margarine. So 
we had much worse technology, much worse methodology, but much better thinking probably. One of the, the conversations that has been had at the RANS conference this week and the, the AMSTRIS conference last week is about data quality. I'm interested, do you think that the sort of data that led to insights 40 years ago, is that quality any better or was it worse than what we now have? Um, there was a drop in quality when we went online. Online surveys are generally not as good as face-to-face -face surveys can implemented by expert interviewers who've been trained and quality checked. And we used to ring people up afterwards to say, were you interviewed on this date? Were you actually this age? So there were all sorts of back checks in the process. So for most studies, the quality was a little bit better in those days, but the speed was slower and the cost was higher. And that was a trade-off that was made. There are exceptions. If you're asking about um, really sensitive topics, then you get better data online. And if you interview somebody for 20 minutes about a new breakfast cereal, you give them, it's a, you're a really nice person interviewing them, and then you say, would you buy this breakfast cereal? They're nearly always gonna say yes in a face-to-face -face situation. So there are other things which are, are different too. Having been in the industry for so long, you must have a lot of stories to tell. In fact, I know you do because I've heard a few of them uh, at various conferences. Is there anything in particular that you're really proud of, something that you've done, something that you've achieved, some, some um, report that you've presented that y you can share with us? Um, well, one of the projects I worked on years and years ago, I remember, was changing the colour for Harvey's Bristol Cream. Um, so there was a project that started with qualitative and then we went into quantitative and I was responsible for the quantitative part and it changed the colour of the glass from brown to blue, it increased sales and what was nice about that was it was a piece of research, it worked and nobody got killed. <laughs> and I say that because you, coming back to how I got into the research industry, I read computer science at university. And in the 1970s, computer science was not a terribly common subject and the computers were fairly pitiful. And most people that I worked with went into things like air traffic control, missile design. And you know, if they get it wrong, somebody dies. <laughs> I get it wrong and the glass is green instead of blue. It's not so bad. So Ray, uh, you set up UMR about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. What was it about the market at that time that prompted you to do so? Nothing about the market. I had written a synopsis for, it would have been the MRS or SMR, and they had not accepted it. I was angry because it was such a good synopsis. So I thought, sod it, I'll put on my own conference. And so we had pretty much the first webinar in the market research world, and its reason was Ray wanted to talk about this topic. As simple as that. As simple as that. And I would say 20% of the reason for new MR is Ray wants to talk about this topic. Another 10 or 20% is Sue and Ray, so my partner in new MR, Sue York, want to learn about this topic. So when we wanted to learn more about gamification, we put on a webinar about gamification and invited experts to come and speak. And then by the end of that process, we are briefed on gamification. And then you get, so it comes back to the curiosity there, and then there's the passion for helping new people get into the process and for sharing information. I, I share stuff with people who don't even want to be shared with. <laughs> uh, I just love finding something out and then telling other people. Your LinkedIn profile, um, I, I think, describes you as being at the intersection of, I'm gonna read this, work, fun, and discovery, um, which I think is pretty cool. I love that. In fact, I think I used it in my intro to you uh, a couple of days ago. What is it that really drives you as a, as a researcher, as an insights person? It is exploration. I love finding out stuff I don't know. Um, people behave differently than I would expect them to behave, and I want to understand why, if I can find a new method, a new tool. So a lot of the advice I give, I would never dream of following. So I tell people, find a good technique and then use it over and over and over again. I find a new technique, use it once, teach it to people, and then look for another technique. Um, that's just who I am. So it's fair to say that what drives you is innovation? Change. 
so it can be innovation, but actually I'm one of those people who like change for the sake of change. And so some of the stuff I do will not be successful. Some of the stuff I do will not be helpful. And I don't really worry about that. Just picking up on change then, if, there's probably a lot of answers to this question, but if you could just pick one thing that you could change about our industry, the insights industry, what do you think it would be? Um, being business focused. I think that the vast majority of the problems we have are because people do not think about how does my client make money? How can I make my help my client make better decisions? And I think if they really understood that, that would be the entry point. Once you understand that's the problem, then you need some basic knowledge of business practice down to that fundamental of how do you make money. How well do you think that we are encouraging younger researchers coming into the industry to be commercially focused, to have that, uh, that business focus? I think we're shockingly bad at it. Um, I don't think that we talk enough about the basics of business. So I think if we talk about what should the induction course be, if we're coming to market research, okay, here are some qualitative research tools, here are some quantitative research tools, here are some data analysis tools, here is business 101. This is how marketing works, this is how business works, um, this, is, this is what net revenue is, this is what profit is, because as a researcher you should know whether your client is trying to maximise revenue, or maximise sales, or maximise profit. Because if you don't know which of those they're doing, you're not necessarily going to design the right research. So what advice would you give to experienced researchers which are bringing the new researchers on to help those new researchers get that focus? Um, you should really ideally have somebody in the organisation with an MBA who is right. pushing in that really strong business direction. Get talking. When you talk to people in the business school, don't just talk to them about how can we teach your business students market research. Learn what's going on because it's the senior people who don't have the business understanding and that's why they're not passing it on to the next generation. The main reason that you're here, or at least the main reason that we're telling people that you're here, is to attend the RANDS conference and to be our keynote speaker, uh, to run a series of workshops which uh, have sold out. Um, that's what we're telling people is the main reason. What we really know is that you're here to go snow, uh, skiing, snowboarding. Snowboarding, snowboarding, snowboarding excuse me. yes. Um, am I right? Is that why you're here? Um, absolutely. Um, I, I'm, I like to think of myself as an early adopter. And in about 1984, I was in... Um, Sun Valley, Idaho, and snowboarding had just started. And so I had a go, I had a lesson. And in those days, you didn't have snowboarding boots. You, you had a big pair of boots that you fastened into the board and you started. And I'm not good, but I love it. I'm going to assume that New Zealand is your favourite place in the world. <laughs> so to, to make this an easy question to answer, what is your second favourite place in the world? The next one. Yeah. And the next place you go to. Yes. What a fantastic. And, and where is that? Where are you heading after New Zealand? Um, I'm going to Edinburgh for Congress, and then I'm going to be speaking on a boat sailing from Lampedusa, which is a small island south of Sicily, um, speaking to people about market research. How focused on me they will be, given the options of cocktails and swimming, I'm not sure. That sounds fantastic and I'm now officially jealous. Ray, thank you so much for spending a bit of time with, uh, with us and sharing your history and all the best for skiing <laughs> and for that trip to Lampalusa. Thanks Jeff. <laughs> <laughs>